Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal. Second time today, if you're watching, obviously I did this morning's video, but I've been to London Colney since then from Mikel Arteta's press conference. Just got home from that and I thought it was quite an interesting press conference actually. Mikel in very, very good mood, positive mood, I thought, very confident. You can you can always tell Mikel's mood, by the way, he handles his press conferences. You can tell if he's rushed, if he just can't be bothered to be there. You can tell within the first couple of questions, but he was very... Um, what's the right word? How would I describe him today? He was just very calm. I thought he was pretty, he was just in a good mood. You could tell he was happy to answer questions. He was joking around and that's always a good sign when it comes to Mikel Arteta and suggests that maybe that was a pretty decent training session that he had just before it. I think he was probably came away from that session feeling pretty good about where the players are ahead of tomorrow's game. Got that impression, certainly by the way he was just carrying himself in that press conference. Some interesting stuff from him on Urian Timber, on Gabriel Jesus, on Jorginho, on the Bournemouth game itself. So I thought I'd pop on, have a quick chat about what he had to say, go over some of the big headlines from it. So let's get started. Big news, everyone is fit. Can you believe that? Everyone is fit. Unless he's pulling a Mikel and there's a couple of injuries we don't know about that have happened in training that he wants to keep under wraps. But he says, everybody is fit and available. Here's the quote from him when he was asked about the latest team news. And he was asked specifically about Urian Timber and the latest team news. He said, yes, everybody is fit and available. So now it's a headache to rate to make the right selection. A good headache. Uh, he was then asked if whether Timber was going to play for the under-21s in their game against Manchester United tonight. And he said he won't be playing in that game tonight, which certainly suggests that Euron Timber is, for the first time since the opening weekend of the season, going to be part of the Arsenal match day squad for a first team game, which is incredible for him. Fantastic for him. I bet you he's going to go to bed tonight in the team hotel. He's probably going to struggle to sleep. He's, he's going to be so excited. I, I presume his family are probably going to be coming over. They were there on that game against Nottingham Forest and they had to watch what happened to him. You know, we can't even imagine how disappointing and upsetting. That was for him, for his family, for everyone involved in that transfer and making it happen to see that, see an injury like that on the opening day of the season. But he's back now. He's worked so hard. He's done his rehab. He's played his couple of under-21s games, but it's going to be involved tomorrow. And that is big, big news for him. Big news for Arsenal as well. Mikel was talking about that and just the impact of having him back in the squad. Um he says, we're not going to know now until we throw him in. It's tricky because it's only three games to go and he's missed eight months of football. He's played only 50 minutes of football with the under-21s. So it's a question that has to be resolved only by throwing him on the pitch and seeing what happens. We have to nail that decision. He's played more than 50 minutes for, for the under-21s. He's played 45 minutes against Blackburn and he played 70 minutes in their game against what was Liverpool, wasn't it? And yeah, look, he probably, I don't know if he will come on tomorrow. If he is part of the squad, if he is on the bench, um, yeah, I, I, I doubt he'll come on unless game state allows it, unless Arsenal are three or four nil up with 10 minutes to go. Maybe Mikel will think this will be a nice moment, bring on Yuri and Timber. But if it's a tight contest, I cannot imagine he's going to be one of the first sort of substitutes that Mikel's going to turn to because you want to know that your players are absolutely on it, 100% fit and match sharp in those situations because there's so much at stake for Arsenal. But just having him on the bench is fantastic. You talked about it today, further stuff in the, in the press who was saying that just having him back in the squad in training, it just raises the competition level at the, at the squad. It raises the competition at, in training, the standards of training, just having a player of that quality around who hasn't been there for the whole season. So it's fantastic. And it, it, he's just going to get such a good reception from the Arsenal fans tomorrow. I imagine during the warm-up, when he first gets up off the bench to go and warm, you know, go and run down the touchline during the first half or second half to do his sort of warm-ups as a substitute. It's going to be a really, really great moment. And I'm really happy for him. And I can't wait to uh, to see him out there. So that's a big update from Mikel's press conference today that Yuri and Timber looks like is going to be part of the match day squad for the first time since that game against Nottingham Forest. In terms of where Arsenal are right now, he was talking about a lot about the Bournemouth game. Obviously, his mates with Areola, they used to play together as juniors. It was like 12-year-olds. They were part of the same football team. So he's known him since he was very, very young. Um, and he was talking about Areola. He was talking about Bournemouth and the job that he was doing, but also where Arsenal are and the opportunity that they have with three games to go. And he was asked about on seizing the moment now with Arsenal for three games to go. And to be fair, I think Arsenal have seized the moment for a long, long time. You know, the, the results have been fantastic in 2024. But he said, absolutely, just focus and put all your energy in finding that determination and willingness to do our best to earn the right to win games. The first one is Bournemouth. It's at home. It's going to be an unbelievable atmosphere again towards the game. Be present and be in the moment 
and let's see what happened. He was asked about treating Bournemouth with the same respect that Arsenal did to Tottenham. And he said the first thing that we did after the Spurs game was try and read where the spirit was and the energy. And they, he means the players there, and they were talking about it already, almost as if it's going to be even more important. Now we have momentum. Now we have to keep going. They know what is at stake. And he was asked if he was hoping for a more boring game than last season's 3-2 against Bournemouth, which of course was that Reese Nelson game. He says, I have, a, I have a different game in my head for tomorrow, but we are going to have to perform really well and be at our best. If we do that, we have a really good chance of winning the game. It's going to be a tough game. Anyone thinking Bournemouth are going to be pushovers are just kidding themselves. Since November, Bournemouth will be fifth in the Premier League with their results. They've been that good. That's the sort of form that they've shown. We saw them go and win at Old Trafford fairly recently um, with a really, really strong performance. And they're just a good side, Bournemouth, which is mad because I mean, the first few games of the season or the first couple of months of the season, I thought they looked a bit of a shambles. They looked like a team that didn't really know what the manager was asking them to do. I mean, when Arsenal went up there and won 4 0, it was such a comfortable win for Arsenal. And Bournemouth just looked like relegation fodder at that point. But they've turned it round. They've obviously adjusted to what the manager is asking for them. They understand what he's asking from them. And they are a good team and they're going to cause Arsenal problems tomorrow. And if anyone needs any sort of reminder of how tough it could be and how they can't afford to take their eye off the ball. It is that 3-2 last season. Within 10 seconds, Arsenal were behind and they were chasing the game. They went 2-0 down and you know it took that amazing comeback to come through and get the results. So you cannot take any game lightly in the Premier League at all, especially a team like Bournemouth who are in such good form and have enjoyed such a good season. They're going to be confident. They've got everything. You know, they've got nothing to lose. They'll come here They'll come to the Emirates tomorrow and they will look to play. And so Arsenal are going to have to treat it like they treated the Spurs game, like they treated the Chelsea game. They cannot take their eye off the ball at all. It would be such a shame between now and the end of the season if there's any sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I can't think of the word off the top of my head, but yeah, complacency, that's what I was looking for. Is Any sort of complacency cre creeps into their game and they end up dropping points that prove costly. You know, they'll they never be able to forgive themselves. And I don't think there will be any complacency. I don't think Arteta, the coaching staff, the players even, will allow that to happen. They know what's at stake. They know how close it is. They know that they've got to put all the pressure they can on Manchester City so they cannot afford to drop any sort of points starting tomorrow at Bournemouth, against Bournemouth. On Jorginho and his new contract, Mikel was asked about that and whether he wants him to stay. And he says, I would love to keep him. He knows that. The club is fully supportive of that. He's a really important player of us on the field and he makes us better. So I want him to stay. Now, we know Arsenal have offered Jorginho a new contract. There is a belief within Arsenal that that contract will be agreed and he will stay. And, you know, I've said it in the last couple of shows. You know, I think it's an easy choice for Arsenal to make. I think Jorginho's had a really, really good season. He's been a fantastic signing. I think he's still got loads to give. Maybe not as a guaranteed starter week in, week out. Well, not as a guaranteed starter week in, week out, because he's not been one of those since he's signed for Arsenal. But he's been a really important squad player. And I think he's got at least a couple more years left in him of being a really important squad player for Arsenal, um, both on and off the pitch. So I think it's an absolute you know, no brainer for me for this new contract. And um, hopefully it will be agreed very, very soon. The fact Mikel was speaking about him like this in the press conference, knowing Mikel like I do and knowing how he handles these sort of questions. The fact he was quite open on this makes me think that he knows it's going to be signed pretty, pretty soon. So we'll wait and see on that. On Gabriel Jesus, not quite as forthcoming in terms of speaking about Gabriel Jesus, but he was asked about the reports recently that Arsenal would be willing to listen to offers for Gabriel Jesus this summer that they would, um, well, basically he potentially could be for sale. And he said, I don't know where this is coming from. And then Mikel was asked, you know, is it your intention? You know, do you have an intention to sell then? And he said firmly, no, no. Um, and you could tell again, by sort of reading his mannerisms and the way he said it, he seemed like he wasn't that happy about it. Um, and, you know, he, he's a, him and Gabriel Jesus are very, very close. You know, Mikel worked very, very hard to bring Gabriel Jesus to the football club. He wanted him. They'd identified him a long, long time before he arrived. And, you know, he knows that he's got injury issues. He's had injury issues. And um, as I said earlier on today, I just don't, I don't think it would be a wise move to sell Gabriel Jesus unless, of course, someone offered stupid money that you couldn't turn down. But I think the focus for me, the priority for me on Gabriel Jesus is getting to the end of the season getting this knee injury sorted, whatever 
operation or whatever sort of medical procedures he needs to get this knee sorted so he can come back, have a proper preseason, and be ready to go next season. I think that's the most important thing when it comes to Gabriel Jesus. And I think if you sell Gabriel Jesus this season, this summer, you are weakening your squad massively because you're not just taking a forward out, a striker out of that squad, you're taking potentially a left winger and a right winger out of that squad as well, and a winner and an experienced player and what part of the leadership group. So it's a, I think it would be a massive call to let Gabriel Jesus go. I think it would be far more important just to try and put all your efforts into getting him fit and getting him ready for the start of the uh, of next season. He was also asked about Declan Rice. This was announced after I did my video this morning, so I didn't talk about it. Uh, but the FWA, the Football Writers Association, announced in their Footballer of the Year. It's gone to Phil Foden at Manchester City. He got 42% of the votes from all the football writers who were uh, who cast their votes. So it was a very convincing victory for him. Declan Rice was runner-up. He was second. I think Martin Odegaard was fourth in that vote. Um, and Mikel was asked about Rice coming second and about the impact he's had at Arsenal in his first season. He said he's been great. He's had such an impact from day one. It's not easy when you come from a club that you've been at for a long time, but he settled really good. It's a great group, and I think they're really supportive with him as well. There are players that just come in and glide and become part of it straight away. I remember a conversation I had with him when he was still in the US in the preseason tour, and he was um, eight or nine days in, and he said, I felt like I've been here already for two years, and that's a good sign. Declan Rice has been fantastic. He's my Arsenal player of the season. It's very close. I was talking to Art De Roche from The Athletic today at the press conference, and we were talking about uh, our player of the season, Arsenal player of the season. He said he would probably give it to Martin Odegaard, and I said Declan Rice, but we were both saying it's basically between those two a flip of the coin. I think my top three, as I did in that show with James Benj, are inside Arsenal Extra Time a few weeks ago when we named our player of the seasons. I had Rice at number one, Odegaard number two, and Gabriel was number three. Um, and I think those are my top three when it comes to player of the seasons. But um, I know a lot of Arsenal fans have been looking at this FWA award and thinking, why has Phil Foden got it? Look, I think Foden's had a great season. It's, you know, there's so many top players in this. We can all have our sort of Arsenal hats on looking at it, but you know, I think what Phil Foden's done for Manchester City this season, you look at the sheer amount of goals he scored, I think he's a deserving winner. Personally, I wouldn't have voted for him, but I can see why others did. Um, and I don't think it's like a disgrace of a decision or anything like that. Right, before we wrap this up, I just wanted to bring up some of your comments from some um, part of the show we were talking about in this morning when someone had asked about a sort of x-factor player someone who could come in and really change things for arsenal the type of player they are looking to bring in this summer and i was saying i wasn't sure names out there i think i said um maybe rafael leao uh, um ac milan or elise as they over here in england and i i put it out there i asked you know which players would you suggest who would you think could come in to this forward line and maybe be that x-factor type player who could just win a game when it's really really tight and do it off the cuff as an individual. And um, I pulled a few of your responses together, and here are some of them. Like Lucas at the top says, magical player Rodrigo from Real Madrid from Real Madrid is gettable. Can play number nine or on both wings. That'll be interesting to see what happens with Rodrigo. Because obviously Kylian Mbappe is going over there come the summer, although obviously it hasn't been announced yet, but that is going to happen. You know, will they maybe have to make space for him? And would Rodrigo potentially be someone they would let go? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, but it's a good shout. I mean, he's a fantastic player, big game player, huge experience despite being so young. And like you said, he can play across the front line. I certainly wouldn't say no to Rodrigo coming to, a, to Arsenal. Darren here says, signs Javi Simons, rapid and can play 10 or on either wing. I mean, I'd be fully supportive of that. I think he's a fantastic player, Simons, but by all accounts, it seems like PSG are determined to take him back and for him to actually be part of that team next season, especially with Kylian Mbappe going. So it looks like he'll be heading back to PSG after his loan spell in Germany. Uh, someone without a name says, Morgan Gibbs-White is the only player, in my opinion, currently playing in the Premier League who can be comparable to Alexis Sanchez physically running a bit, um, sorry, and can compare to Alexis Sanchez's physicality, running ability and skills. The Smith Rowe is to be for sale, that is an absolutely perfect replacement for him. Yeah, I don't look at Morgan Gibbs White as maybe as an X Factor player, if you see what I mean, but I do think look at him as a fantastic player who I would absolutely not turn my nose up when it comes to signing for Arsenal. I was talking about this to other journalists when I was over in um, Munich for the Champions League game, and we were talking about Gibbs White. And, you know, I think someone's going to get him this summer, and I worry it might be Spurs. And um, I don't want him to go to Spurs because I actually think he's really, really good. 
And I think he could be an excellent player for Arsenal, Morgan Gibbs White. I think wherever he goes, whether it be Spurs, Newcastle, or, or someone, I think they're going to get a fantastic player with huge, huge potential. And this is, you know, when he went to Spurs, when he went to Forest from Wolves, I was like, what on earth are they spending that sort of money on Morgan Gibbs White for? It's proved me wrong massively. I think he's been fantastic in a, you know, pretty average team. I think he could well go and be a really special player somewhere else. So I think that's a that's a fairly good shout. Um, is that Puyasso? Sorry, I'm going to pro- I'm probably got that terribly wrong. But high team, I would sign Kudus and Vatinha from PSG. I've seen Kudus taking matters into his own hands when playing for Ghana at the World Cup. He has that X factor in him. He does. Vatinha would give us options in midfield. God forbid if anything ever happens to Odegaard, because I don't see a player that can slot in his place and not have a drop off in quality for the current squad. I think with Vitinha, I think he's playing so well for PSG and he's so important for PSG at the moment. I can't see he would be uh, he would be available for sale. Kudus is an interesting one because I think he does have a release clause at West Ham. But then you'd look at that and think, if you're an English club and you're looking at what Kudus has done at West Ham, you'd, you'd almost feel guilty about triggering that release clause and spending huge amounts of money knowing that you could have got him for about 30 million a year earlier when West Ham did from Ajax because he was available and he was there to be got. And then suddenly you're going to probably have to pay, what, triple the amount or something <laughs> to, to get him out of West Ham. So they might be holding him back. But look, he's a fantastic player, Kudus. He's been so impressed with what he's done at West Ham. So that's a good shout. JC um, Marsh says, X-Factor player would be Leroy Sane. That's a very good shout as well. Obviously knows Mikel Arteta, likes Mikel Arteta. He saw how explosive he could be in the Champions League semi-final against Real Madrid. And then Teta98 says, in the Prem, magical players from outside the big six, Eze, Elise, Isaac, Bailey, Kudus and Neto. I think they're all forwards who are capable of taking on their opponent and creating something out of nothing. Um, yeah, good shout. All of those listed. Eze, Elise, I spoke about earlier. Isaac, obviously, is right at the top of my list for who I'd want Arsenal to sign. Neto, I love as a player. Do worry about those injuries, though, I have to say. All right, that's it from me again today. Double helping of Inside Arsenal. I hope that's all right. And uh, you still managed to watch some of them. I'll be at the Emirates tomorrow. I will try and do my video after the game. I'm not in the press box, so I'm in my seat. So uh, it might be a little bit later than usual, but keep your eyes peeled for that. Anyway, if you're going to the game, be loud. Need a really big atmosphere there tomorrow, hopefully to see another Arsenal win as they try, fingers crossed, and get this title wrapped up. Until then, everyone, have a fantastic Friday. Enjoy the start to your weekend. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.